Hello, my name is Paz, and as usual when addressing an audience, I am here to talk about women. But before I start, I wish to ask a question to all the girls in the audience. When was the first time you realized you were a woman and everything that it implied? It may sound like a strange question, but take a couple of seconds to think about it. Under which circumstances did you figure out that there were things that you went through that the men around you in similar situations didn't? Things that you had to do that other people simply just didn't have to do. When was the first time you noticed that a label had been assigned to you and that it seemed to determine the way you were seen and treated by the people around you? The first time I was conscious about being a woman, I was nine. And nine wasn't by far the first time I had heard about how cruel the world was to women. But when you're a kid, words like systemic violence or misogyny don't mean a lot, do they? Yes, horrible things happen to women, but don't horrible things happen to everyone? In my almost infinite innocence, I believed I was beyond any kind of violence, women targeted or otherwise. For this reason, I begged my parents to let me go on public transport alone to my English lessons. I am old enough, I said, to know my way around town. So there I was, a mildly chubby, odd-looking little girl standing on a bus and anxiously looking outside the window when I felt the body press itself to my back. Now, I've always been somewhat short-sighted, but from the corner of my eyes, I could see that there was plenty of space in the bus where the man could stand. And I knew it was a man because I saw him laughing when I got out in the next stop, despite not being my final destination. It somehow felt as if my body, my nine-year-old body, wasn't my own anymore. Of the many things that I understood that day, the most important one was that I was indeed one of the women. I was the same species as the girls whose deaths were announced on TV every day. I was one of them, and my fate could be the same as theirs. In her diaries, the American poet Sylvia Plath wrote, being born a woman is my awful tragedy. From the moment I was conceived, I was doomed to sprout breasts and ovaries rather than penis and scrotum, to have my whole circle of action, thought, and feeling rigidly circumscribed by my inescapable femininity. Yes, my consuming desire to mingle with road crews, sailors, and soldiers is spoiled by the fact that I am a girl, a female, always in danger of assault and battery. Yet, God, I want to talk to everybody I can as deeply as I can. I want to be able to sleep in an open field, to travel west, to work freely at night. After that event, it didn't take me long to come to a similar conclusion to that of Sylvia Plath. Every action I decided to make, every path I chose to take, always involved further consideration because I was indeed a woman. And that made me angry. And as an angry prepubescent child, I consciously decided to reject everything that would make me more of a woman than I already was. Everything associated with the female gender I avoided. Dolls, they were for girly girls. Dresses, no way. The color pink, vetoed. I began wearing baggy hoodies twice my size and I tied my hair in a boring ponytail that I refused to let go of, even for special occasions. I looked at my father for references on how to behave instead of my mother, and I looked down upon my traditionally feminine classmates. I rejected my womanhood not because I didn't identify with it, but because to me it was synonym of paralysis and negative inertia. It was filled with negative connotations I did not want to be affected by. At the age of 12, I had succeeded in becoming a middle-aged grumpy man. At the age of 12, however, I had also gone through many situations similar to the one in the bus. Being groped in crowds, whistled at on the streets, cat called on dark alleys. No matter what I did, it seemed that as long as it was noticeable that I was a woman, people would treat me as such, in spite of acting and behaving like a boy, in spite of not being traditionally feminine at all, in spite of refusing the gender role that had been assigned to me. In her book, The Second Sex, Simone de Beauvoir states that one is not born, but rather becomes a woman. And the way I was treated by my community seemed to confirm this statement. There is an inescapable correlation between being a woman and being constantly in danger of assault and battery, despite how many people try to deny that. In contemporary society, this correlation is more present in some places than others, the country I was raised in being one of them. Gender inequality and gender violence in Peru is an issue widely discussed due to its impact and relevance, but it is often disregarded as an invention and treated as a joke. 
In 2019, the number of women killed by gender violence reached 165, the highest number of the decade. In addition, 14,491 14, cases of violence against women and domestic and sexual violence were registered by the Peruvian Emergency Centers for Women. The term femicide was defined by the South African activist Diana Russell as the killing of females by males because they are female. In Peru, the term femicide started to attract attention in 2011 when it was recognized by the penal code thanks to the work of several feminist groups. As a society, we have struggled for a long time to see a difference between a woman killed at the hands of a thief who intends to rob her and a woman punched, stabbed, choked, or even, and even killed by her partner. Statistically speaking, one out of two women in Lima and two out of three in Cusco have suffered from physical or sexual violence at the hands of their romantic partners. As a Peruvian woman myself, I can't help but wonder if I am going to be one of those two at some point in my life. The odds seem to be against me, and no matter what I do, and it appears to be that the situation does not improve with time, so I can't help but ask myself, how many choices away am I from suffering the same fate as all those women have? Every shortcut I take home to get quicker, every time I leave the cinema after dark, every crowded bus I board, every person I decide to trust, I wonder, are my choices as a woman bringing me closer to a toxic marriage, to a life of abuse, to a cycle of violence that will end with my death at the hands of the person I thought I loved? People who try to disregard and disqualify women's struggle in the contemporary world often say, but women can choose now, and they can choose over plenty of things. What they fail to tell you is that the problem is no longer in the act of choosing, but in the consequences that set choices have. I didn't learn all of this on my own. I had some help. I started joining feminist collectives around the same time high school began. My feminist sisters made me realize that a woman's choices were her own to make, and that what came afterward was the part that they were trying, trying to fix. To choose is to be in constant motion, and that motion is essential to freedom. With complete certainty about my intrinsic right to choose for myself, I looked at my future once again, a little older and a little wiser than the last time. If wherever I went, the, word, the road would be equally harder, then which path should I choose? The shortest, the safest, the nicest? I know now that I can make choices for myself, but the question is, what choices should I make? To answer this, I decided to look back to all the women who have shaped my life all the women who I got to understand a bit better after I experienced my fair share of what it was to be a woman and be treated as such by the rest of the world. I'll talk about six lessons I learned from the women in my life and how their choices have affected mine. First lesson, to learn. The first lesson came to me through my mother's mother. When my grandmother was a child, a fever paralyzed the left side of her body almost completely. And if there was a truth to 1950s Peru, it was that women and disabled people were two of the most marginalized groups in society and she happened to belong to both. Born to a large family, my grandmother lived through a time of changes, especially in South America. Less than 10 years after women obtained the right to vote in the country, my grandmother studied in a university that had been for men only for quite a long time, where she graduated as the, as the top student of her career. Throughout her life, my grandmother worked in several schools, most of which were low-income governmental institutions. She did so not only to financially support her family as a single mother, but because she understood with complete certainty that education was a tool of unmeasurable worth. Often she would tell me stories of, her, of the competitions that her students had won and of the love that they had for her and her classes, even when they were raised in a toxic environment where education led at the bottom of a long list of priorities. Her love for education went hand in hand with the courage and drive to support her two-person family. From her, I learned to look at life as an ongoing lesson from which one absorbs all the knowledge that hands can hold. She taught me many things, like reading and writing, but she also taught me the intrinsic value of education and encouraged me to keep on learning for as long as I lived. Second lesson, to love. This second lesson came to me through my other grandmother, my father's mother. While we've all heard the empowering stories of women who broke free from the gender role that they were assigned, my grandmother's story is slightly different. She had a choice to make when she made my grandfather, and it was between marrying him and studying a career. She chose him. Once I asked her if she regretted that decision, she said she didn't. I pushed more, expecting that the reason, the reason to be that her children and grandchildren wouldn't have existed, for example. To my surprise, she just said, I loved myself long enough to know I was making the right choice. Though she and my grandfather stayed married for over 50 years, I firmly believe that her greatest project was herself and her happiness. 
From her, I learned that only through loving yourself, you could truly love everyone else around you. Third lesson, to fight. The third lesson also comes from an elderly woman, but unlike my grandmother's, she wasn't allowed to make decisions about anything for the first half of her life. This woman, who I warmly refer to as Comadre, worked in my house since before I was born. After that, she took care of me while my parents worked. She always wore two long back braids that united at the bottom of her back, and her hands, though rough as a result of years working the land, were always warm and gentle. Once I asked her how many children she had, she said that she had, had, had given birth to 11, but that only four of them were alive. I didn't ask more about the subject, but later that day, I questioned my mother about this woman's past. She said that her life had been one that awaits most women born to rural households that sustain themselves from their land and their work. She was sold to an older man when she was young. She got married, and since then, she has had to live a life of abuse and silence in the highlands of my city. She had been beaten to unconsciousness by her alcoholic husband so many times that she couldn't keep track of them anymore. However, as bruised as she might have been, she still had to lift herself up and work the earth to sustain herself and the many children she was forced to give birth to, often without medical attention, which ended in the death of the babies. I'm fine now, she had once said. He left me some years ago, and my children take care of me now. I work for myself, and I make my own money. For me, the face of that woman is the face of my country. It is a scarred face, a tired face. That woman embodies the injustice which, which, with which all indigenous women are treated in my country and in the world. At the same time, however, she also embodies strength. From her, I learned to fight. Hers is a fight that no one should fight. Hers is a fight that nobody wins. Hers is a fight that sadly not many survive. Fourth lesson, to speak. The fourth lesson was given to me by my aunt, my father's sister. I was always marveled by her self-confidence and outgoing personality, something which I aspired to have when I was little. I stopped seeing her husband after a while, and the only mention of his name was to announce his visit during special occasions such as Christmas or birthdays. It wasn't until some years after her divorce that during a conversation, she joked about being physically hurt by her ex-husband. On a different occasion, while we were talking about hair, she melancholically mentioned her once abundant brown mane that after being brutally pulled so many times, never grew back. These fleeting mentions of her abuse slowly constructed a picture of what her married life had been. When I was mature enough to deal with the answer, I asked her what had happened. We had a long talk about what it was like to live stuck in a cycle of violence, to emotionally depend on people. She told me that silence was the cage she was stuck in, which is why only speaking set her free. Though it wasn't easy, everything about her is unstoppably loud now. Her laughter, her voice, and her freedom. Fifth lesson, to let go. The fifth lesson was given to me by my mom. I find it very hard to sometimes, every hard, so every time someone asks me to describe my mom to them, I find it very hard. For me, she is so many things at the same time, a mother, a friend, an advisor, that I couldn't possibly define what, she, what exactly she means to me and how much she has influenced my life. The reason I mention this is because when I tried to choose amongst the many lessons that she had given me, I found myself trying to describe her and the effect she has on people. She is, without a doubt, one of the most important women in my life. However, how can I possibly begin to describe her? I would say that my mom baffles people because she lives her life unapologetically, something that is not very welcome from where I come from. But she doesn't care. She subverts expectations. She shifts and changes without providing an explanation. She's multifaceted and shines different lights depending on where you're standing. For me, that is a wonder. But for many, it is a curse. I believe that this lesson ultimately comes down to the act of letting go. Being who she is, my mom rejects inertia by choosing herself over everything else. And I believe she makes the right choice every time. Sixth lesson, to laugh. Finally, I would like to talk about my 12-year-old sister. The lesson she has to offer is concrete and concise because even when we're separated, she reminds me through phone calls and videos to laugh. She is even more innocent than I was at her age, and I can't help but wonder if she has also gone through a situation that has made her question her womanhood the same way I did. Not a day goes by where I don't fear seeing my sister in a missing poster. Thinking of her overflows my mind with all the statistics about gender violence that I know by heart, and I am overcome with paralyzing fear. A part of me asks, 
How cruel can the word be to little girls? And I look back on my life. I realize that it is not my sister's duty or any girl's duty to make their choices revolve around, around being safe. It is not my sister's job to be safe. It is the rest of the words. Each one of us has the responsibility to make the world fairer for everyone, but especially for little girls, to be able to laugh free, free of danger, fear, free of fear. That's what she taught me. And it is because of all of them that I am here now. I have tried to take these six lessons into consideration whenever facing a difficult choice, but also for facing the ever-present threat of inertia. It is through these women's wisdom and experiences that I have come to understand with, a more, with more depth and compassion how far the, the fight for equality has come, but how far it has still yet to go. If there is a final word that can summarize the influence that these lessons have had on me, I think it would be hope. I am filled with hope for the future, a brighter future, where women's choices are theirs to make. I am hopeful for every one of them, and I am hopeful for myself. To address all the girls in the audience one last time, this talk is just a little reminder of the beauty and power that underlies the act of choosing for yourself, for your mind, and for your body. A decision might seem like a trivial thing for most, but for us, it is the ultimate act of revolution and justice, and it should be celebrated as such. These lessons, learn, love, fight, speak, let go, laugh, I give to you now as they were given to me, not encouraging you to follow them as mine, but hoping that you'll find a reason to make them, the, to make them yours. I will continue to learn from all the great women that I encounter every day in my life, and thankfully, this word and auditorium is full of them. I will pick their wisdom and strength up with the same care I employed to pick, pick flowers in the field when I was little. And as Carol Ann Duffy put it in one of her poems, out of the forest I come with my flowers singing all alone. Thank you.